Good afternoon, everyone. We're thrilled to be presenting a timely panel entitled Beyond Redlining, Black Lives Matter and Community Development, sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. This panel is part two of a series of rapid response webinars on this topic. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit, visit AmericanBar.org forward slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. Before we go into our program and how today will work, I'd like to introduce Ms. Judy Perry Martinez, president of the American Bar Association, who will give a few remarks. Well, thank you so much. I'm honored to join with all of you today for this critically important discussion. As the dialogue continues in your, from your last program uh, in June, uh, thanks to the ABA section of civil rights and social justice for hosting this and so many other vital webinars. These honest conversations about the development and layout and disparities of the communities of our nation are essential if we are going to move our country forward with the hope that we will do better and be better. The recent study by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, which is one of the focuses of this discussion, addresses long-term adverse impacts of redlining on community development, housing and education and economic justice. These are strains that have disproportionately, disproportionately been put on generations of communities of color. Truths are being spoken about the prevalent persistent racism in our systems and broader civil society. And there is much pain as our country remains plagued by deep-seated racism. We cannot go back to what was normal ever again. Black Lives Matter, and we must hear that call as well as the calls on the streets, the demands on the streets for racial equity. It's important to identify systemic inequities, but also those closer to home. Last month, the ABA launched a racial equity in the justice system website that brings together the many resources we have for our members, the legal profession, and the public on a range of issues addressing bias, racism, and prejudice in the justice system and beyond. The website is updated frequently to reflect a growing amount of content that we are gathering from across the ABA. So we hope you'll refer to it and use it as we approach, as we approach what we need to do and as we each have a contribution to make toward greater justice and equity. There is an undeniable reality that despite some progress and a hopeful future. For many black people, equity has not been realized and there has been little release from the economic and societal chains of slavery, just a shift in the type of enslavement. That must end now and human dignity compels all of us to speak against wrongs that we hear and see, but also to act to right unjust laws, practices, and their effects. And that is a particular responsibility of lawyers in our country. With the individual commitment of each attendee who has joined us today for this important webinar, and with a fierce spirit for racial equity and justice at the helm of our future, I'm confident that discussions like this one ahead with this exceptional panel and participating audience will address the challenges and put us on a path to essential racial equity. So thank you all for joining us today and thanks again to our esteemed panel for giving of their time and talent and sharing it with you because this issue is so critically important if we are to go forward to a justice and equity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. We truly appreciate all of the work you're doing. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address the questions at the end of the panel. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we're thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Beyond Red Lighting, Black Lives Matter and Community Development Part Two. Redlining is a process by which banks and other institutions refuse to offer mortgages or offer worse rates to customers in certain neighborhoods based on their racial and ethnic composition. Redlining is one of the clearest examples of institutionalized racism in American history. 
Although the practice was banned in 1968 with the passage of the Fair Housing Act, it continues in various forms to this day. Our panelists today are Mr. Barrett Holmes Pittner, Ms. Patience Crowder, Ms. Sheila Foster, and Ms. Monique Worrell. And I'm your moderator. I am Diamond Griffith, a 3L at Barry University and a member of the Black Law Student Association. Our first speaker is Ms. Monique Worrell. She is a criminal and social justice reform advocate who brings a 360 degree view of the conversation and a deep understanding of the issues. By working as a defense attorney, trial lawyer, law professor, assistant state attorney, and chief legal officer, she has experienced the problems in the criminal legal system from all sides. She most recently served as the chief legal officer of Reform Alliance, a nonprofit organization focused on national probation and parole pro reform. She is currently a candidate for state attorney in Florida's Ninth Circuit. And with that, I will allow Ms. Monique Orrell to speak. Thank you so much. When we look at the history of our country, we know that we just focused on the 400th uh, anniversary, for lack of a better word, of slavery in this country. And we went from slavery to the Jim Crow. So we evolved, slavery evolved. When we stopped or ended slavery, it evolved to Jim Crow. And then after Jim Crow, it evolved again to the redlining that was spoken of earlier. And currently we've evolved from redlining to mass incarceration. So essentially we've had an evolution of slavery, of slavery over the last 400 years. And it's led us to where we are in current day. So I wanna talk about that a little bit in the context of what happened in redlining, how we ended up to this place of mass incarceration, how it incorporates with the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality that has been the subject of uh, our country essentially over the last month. In the redlining process, African Americans were essentially stopped from gaining wealth by being kept out of the housing uh, ability, by being denied funding for loans. They were not able to participate in the acquisition of wealth in the same way white families were. And the reason that's important for the context of criminal justice is when people commit crime, it's typically because they lack resources. And there are people who will say things like, well, we all have the same opportunities. We all live in this great country. And if I can get up and go to work and you know buy nice things for myself, then so should everyone else. But the reality is systemically African-Americans have been kept from opportunities to acquire wealth in the same way as their Caucasian counterparts. So with redlining, a lot of white families were able to build because they were allowed to have, and over the course of time, that funding turned into equity. And the individuals were able to get equity in their property that they then used that equity to send their children to school, to take care of their uh, elder and to buy more property. Meanwhile, black families were not able to achieve those same opportunities and when they were finally able to buy property, it was at a rate that was not affordable. And essentially that has led to the wealth gap that we see in modern day. Now, with that wealth gap comes a lack of resources. With that lack of resources comes crime. So it is irresponsible 
for us to look at crime without looking at the context in which it was systemically created by our country. Now, the although slavery ended, there was an exception to slavery in the Constitution. And that exception was for individuals who were incarcerated. And what we've done is we've just shifted slavery. So I said earlier, we really haven't ended it. It's just evolved. So the exception to slavery is for those individuals who we incarcerate in our criminal justice system. And interestingly, if you look at the timeline, we were dealing with slavery from 1619 um, uh, to 1865. And then the Jim Crow segregation from 1877 to the 1960s. And then uh, redlining from 1934 to the 1960s. And then right after that, mass incarceration in the 1970s to present. So it's important to understand the timeline because in understanding the timeline, you understand that we never really ended slavery, we just evolved it from generation to generation to generation. So as we look at mass incarceration, we have to understand that African-Americans make up 18% of the population, but more than 40% of the prison population. Here in Florida, it's much higher. African-Americans make up more than 50% of the prison population. Now, some may think that's because African-Americans commit more crime. However, studies and research shows that African-Americans are policed more than their white counterparts, that they are arrested more frequently than their white counterparts. They are prosecuted more harshly than their white counterparts and sentenced to much longer uh, and harsher prison sentences and jail sentences than their white counterparts. So these are all facts, they're statistics. There are studies that have been done. This research is there. This isn't Monique's opinion. This is well-documented material. So how do we address those things? When we look at it from the context and, and it's important to follow the history. And, and that's one of the problems with the fact that a lot of this isn't taught in our school system. So you have to sort of do independent research to become informed and you have to intentionally dig deep uh, with regards to this information. And then when we look at the recent information about what has happened with Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, uh, police brutality, the public outrage that has erupted over continued police brutality, if you look at it in a historical context, then you understand that this is another level of the evolution of slavery. And that is why it is so outrageous that we essentially have government sanctioned murder of black bodies. So when, when you look at policing and how policing is in, in you know, different neighborhoods, you see that in poor black and brown neighborhoods, the policing is much more aggressive. As I have been a candidate for state attorney here in Florida, I've gone and visited some of the different communities. And one of the communities that I visited were very upset because they had two different police agencies patrolling their neighborhoods. Now, it is a high crime neighborhood, but the presence of the police in the neighborhood has not stopped the crime. It's only increased the arrest and the prosecutions. So when we look at that over policing and we look at the militarization of the policing and the abuse that happens at the hands of police, that's where we have the intersection with the history of our country and the current state of law enforcement and mass incarceration and the criminal legal system uh, that we have today. Um, I believe my time is coming to a close, uh, so I want to be respectful of that. Uh, but essentially, beyond redlining is really just showing us the evolution of slavery. The Black Lives Matter movement is just today's activist 
talking about what we've been talking about for 400 years in this country. And we have to begin to actually implement solutions and not just evolve a problem that has been uh, his, an historic problem over the last 400 years. And we do that through legislation. We do that through intentionality. That has really been my biggest thing, putting people in positions to make change who are actually focused on these issues, not denying them as if they don't exist because our history and the evidence and the research shows us that it does, but people who are intentional about moving forward and making a difference that will last and not just continue to evolve the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Worrell. Our next speaker is Ms. Sheila Foster, who has joint appointments at Georgetown University at the Scott K. Ginsburg Professor of Urban Law and Policy and Professor of Public Policy. Professor Foster writes in the areas of environmental law and justice, urban land use law and policy and state and local government. Her most recent work explores questions of urban law and governance through the lens of the commons exemplified by her article, The City as a Commons, Yale Law and Policy Review, and forthcoming MIT press book, The Co-City. Professor Foster has been involved on many levels with urban policy. She currently is the chair of the advisory committee of the Global Parliament of Mayors, a member of the Aspen Institute's Urban Innovation Working Group, an advisory board member of the Marin Institute for Urban Management at NYU and sits on the New York City panel on climate change. Thank you so much, Ms. Foster, for being here today. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. This is a wonderful series. And just following up on the last speaker uh, to talk about how the uh, legacy of slavery and then uh, legal, legalized segregation and discrimination follows us into the present. I wanna focus my remarks on how we understand what's happening uh, with the way in which uh, COVID-19 has hit African-American communities and other communities of color. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to share my screen uh, for a moment and show a couple of images, if you don't mind. Okay. So um, I want to talk about um, what I call the racial uh, geography of COVID-19 inequality. Um, when the coronavirus first hit the United States, and in fact the world, we kept hearing that the virus does not discriminate. Um, and we now know that although the virus is a neutral actor, like a hurricane and other events, that it lands on a social structure that does discriminate. And so New York City was the hot spot for COVID um, for a couple of months. And as we can see from this uh, map here, uh, COVID ha um, has uh, 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 concentrated its impact in communities of color, the Bronx, outer Brooklyn, parts of Staten Island. Um, and we now know from the data that the area where COVID rates um, and deaths of, um, have higher Black and Hispanic or Latinx populations on average and lower um, Asian and white shares. And this is mirrored across the United States um, in many cities and states. Um, this is even controlling for poverty, right? The poverty rate is similar in neighborhoods with high and low infection rates in New York. What else do we know about these communities? The share of adults with college degrees uh, decreases as the prevalence of the cases of the infections increase. There are higher rates in areas where less of the population is able to work from home. Uh, so we know that a lot of us have been um, sheltered in place at home working, but in many of these communities, they're essential workers and they were getting on public transportation and exposing themselves much more than uh, populations that were able to shelter in place. And even when these populations came home and were able to be at home, um, COVID-19 infections were more prevalent in areas where people reside in crowded units. So we know that this is not um, a disease of uh, urban density, but rather of indoor crowding. And um, as a corollary, to that uh, prison populations, which are also crowded spaces are, as we know, 
um, overwhelmingly African American and people of color uh, who are also more exposed. And so uh, we know that, you know, this geography of inequality is mapped, right, um, or around race and ethnicity. Um, another interesting um, um, uh, exhibition or example of this is what happened in parts of New York City uh, where these populations are not predominant. Uh, the parts of uh, Manhattan in particular, um, where rates were low, um, in fact, the residents were able to go to their second homes and their country homes. The other thing we know that was happening in New York is that um, the, um, the rules that came out of the city um, indicating that people should uh, socially distance and wear masks, when those rules were then enforced, of course, the enforcement fell very hard on um, uh, that 35 of the 40 arrested were African Americans in the city. I'm gonna stop my share now. So how do we understand this as a, an example of uh, structural racism, right? Conventional wisdom holds that COVID hit African Americans disproportionately because of their underlying comorbidities, such as respiratory diseases, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cardiac uh, disease. But what we haven't heard a lot about is the way that these comorbidities are tied to underlying structural inequalities. So for instance, we know that higher, higher COVID mortality rates occur in counties with high levels of air pollution, or what we call fine particulate air pollution, PM2.5, according to a recent study. And we also know from previous studies that uh, race and exposure to PM2.5 or to air pollution are strongly correlated. There are severe black and white disparities um, in, um, uh, um, in air pollution rates and also in respiratory diseases, which leave people very vulnerable to COVID-19. Um, and so uh, these um, illnesses are uh, disproportionately present in African-American uh, communities along with asthma. Um, and that's due not just to outdoor, but also to indoor air quality with higher rates of mold and uh, cockroaches in substandard housing. So not surprisingly, in New York City, the Bronx and uh, Southern uh, Brooklyn are areas in which um, as many as one in three households have asthma and other respiratory illnesses and also have high levels of air pollution. Similarly, there are racial inequities in access to healthy food and the availability of green amenities. So when we weren't sheltering at home, we were told to get out and go to the park and walk around and get fresh airs. But these are spaces that are um, lacking in these same communities and um, even when they're present in cities, they're not in uh, close proximity to these communities. In addition, um, as we've just heard, racism itself is a major stressor. Um, experience in settings ranging from police interactions to employment. Um, and these, as medical um, uh, studies have shown us, these incidents contribute to heart disease, hypertension, and other illnesses. One question is, what does the law have to do with this? And how can we address this when we talk about uh, neutral factors uh, that are the legacy of explicit race discrimination in laws, but, um, but are not uh, race specific themselves? So we can try to trace much of this structural inequality that drives these disparities um, to uh, neutral zoning land use laws, number one, that have concentrated polluting facilities and communities of color, which are more likely to be zoned mixed use industrial and residential. Um, we know that uh, through previous racial zoning, redlining and housing discrimination practices, African-Americans have been historically excluded from single family or single family neighborhoods uh, with better quality housing, less pollution and environmental amenities uh, such as parks are um, abundant. And even after these practices were outlawed, were outlawed rather, um, we know that racist lending practices and housing discrimination practices persist locking these neighborhoods into economic and racial segregation and disadvantage. And so what we're starting to see now is that for renters in many places, eviction rates among African-American households are multiple times those of white. 
um, and uh, poor enforcement of building codes, uh, poor enforcement of warranties of habit, uh, habitability also put these same renters um, at risk of living in substandard housing, heightened risk of the disease, and heightened risk of eviction. So better enforcement, um, just to wrap up, I think of existing legal protections would be a start to addressing the vulnerability of some of these populations, right? Even in a world in which we have less overtly racist laws, but we have a legacy of those laws and continuing neutral practices that lock in the effects of those laws. There are actually um, steps that we can take as lawyers to begin to unravel this, right? Um, and so a couple things that I would uh, recommend and that we see happening already. Um, number one is that uh, that we see laws and policies that have played, I'm sorry, a, uh, a critical role in, um, in facilitating environmental racism or maintaining residential segregation can be re-engineered to deconcentrate this uh, disadvantage in communities of color. So some cities have banned illness causing land uses and barred industries harmful to these communities from being cited in already polluted uh, communities. Other cities like Minneapolis, for instance, are, um, are reforming their zoning laws to achieve racial equity by um, banning the construction or eliminating single family zoning. And eliminating this kind of zoning will reduce systemic barriers to entry by African Americans into previously segregated neighborhoods. Um, so I think we need more lawyers on the front lines, right? Uh, to not just enforce uh, some of the laws like environmental laws that we have in place, but also to begin to unravel the disadvantage through uh, new reforms uh, that strike at the heart of racial segregation and discrimination. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Foster. Our next speaker is Ms. Patience Crowder, who is an associate professor at the University of Denver, where she joined the faculty in 2010 to create and teach the Community Economic Development Clinic. Prior to joining the faculty, she was the Wellspring Assistant Clinical Professor of Law at Tulsa College of Law, where she formed and taught a transactional legal clinic. She began her career in the Legal Academy as a clinical fellow in the Community Development Clinic at the University of Baltimore School of Law after working in Sacramento, California as the business development manager of a nonprofit corporation that works to revitalize an inner city neighborhood through economic development and public education. She began her legal career as a bank finance associate with Shearman and Sterling in San Francisco, California. Her scholarship examines the impact of contract, corporate, and local government law and transactional advocacy for public interest, particularly the revitalization of inner city and underserved communities. Thank you so much, Professor Crowder, for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to participate in this panel. Um, I'm just going to set my timer, make sure that I'm being uh, respectful. Um, so thank you, Diamond, for that introduction. I um, want to add a couple of things to that just to provide some context for my remarks. So in addition to the Community Economic Development Clinic, I teach the um, Community Innovation and Equity Project Clinic at DU. And for those of you who might be unfamiliar, our law clinics, legal clinics throughout the country focus on providing generally free legal representation to certain types of um, uh, individuals and populations in need. And my focus has always been on transactional law. So we represent small businesses, artists, and nonprofit organizations on a host of transactional matters from a startup to working with existing companies and businesses. Um, and that work has informed my research. Um, and one of the things that I wanna talk to you about today briefly. Uh, so we are in a historic moment as Judy's uh, opening remarks suggested. And that historic moment comes from a legacy that both Monique and, and Sheila have outlined for us. Um, but brings us to this particular moment in time where we have the ability, I'm hopeful, to sort of think bigger and broadly in terms of what we want to do to sort of maintain 
wins that African Americans and others of people of color have um, attained over the course of time in the history, but also what, where can we pivot and where can we do things different um, built on where we are today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that idea might look like or could look like in the context of the research um, that I'm currently working on. So as Diamond said, my work focuses on transactional advocacy in the public interest. I look for uh, opportunities, non-litigation strategies to advance economic justice. Um, one of the um, umbrella terms that I'm using to, to describe my work is impact transaction. And I just want to impact that briefly so that I can explain the idea that I want to talk about later. Um, impact transaction is about using strategic use of agreements and voluntary mechanisms between cross-sector parties to advance broad social change. And it's a complementary legal strategy to impact litigation, which I think is a phrase that many of us, um, both within the legal field and without, are familiar with. Impact litigation works to reform institutional um, works to reform institutions in education and environmental law, government agencies, and also private entities and corporations to also affect broad scale local change um, through the procurement of individual rights that can then be um, uh, extrapolated out to, to others. So if we think about the recent, well, not so much recent, but the, um, uh, the same sex marriage case where couple sued to be able to get married, they weren't the only ones who were allowed to be married. Same sex marriage became a right for citizens throughout the country. One of the most um, famous impact litigation cases is Brown v. Board of Education, where um, the goal was to desegregate public education. And the outcome, of course, was not limited to just um, the plaintiffs in that case, but broadly applied to all um, people of color, particularly African Americans at that time, to desegregate public education and integrate education. So those are examples of impact litigation. My idea of impact transaction picks up as a complementary strategy to impact litigation to think about what are ways that we can achieve broad scale social change through agreement and voluntary agreement that's not in the context of adjudication. And why I think that is important, because if you look at a case like Brown, which is historic in its context, um, today's public schools are as segregated or more segregated than when Brown was decided. And one of the reasons for that is because Brown didn't offer an implementation strategy. Um, it basically asked states or told states, desegregate and find your own plan. So one of the things that I'm trying to do in my research is find ways to build on wins like Brown, like the Lilly Ledbetter legislation for the Equal Pay Act, things that give us judicial wins, but also could use transactional um, resources to sort of advance those wins and those goals. Um, and I think that this is critically important now. And again, because I, I do get this one critique from folks who litigate, which I don't do. Not saying litigation is important. It is. Uh, I would not be here for, but for wins and impact litigation. Um, but the purpose of this project is to look at what the historic wrongs have been to people of color and African Americans and how, in addition to litigation, transactional law can be of assistance. Um, so the particular project in this income, I'm sorry, impact litigate, impact transaction um, model that I'm looking at is how we can um, correct the wrongs that Monique and Sheila sort of talked about that stem from the historic um, horrors of redlining. So Monique talked a lot about the wealth gap that arose as a result of the formal and now informal practice of redlining. And I want to put that sort of in the context of um, small business development. So Sheila pointed out, so she drew a nice line between how the historic wrongs of redlining led to or can contribute to sort of the COVID hotspots that we see today, right? Because historically, um, African Americans and now other people of color were required to live in certain neighborhoods or prohibited from living in other neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods are also sort of tracking hotspots in terms of um, um, how racial disparities are showing up through historic, in, in COVID, through the historic um, discrimination of redlining. And I want to say that redlining um, in the context of housing 
is something that Monique talked about and has been well documented. And that is also true in the context of business development and um, this sort of idea of business gentrification. So uh, there's a, a definition from a 1979 publication of uh, the Challenge magazine that to just to supplement what Monique said about redlining in the housing context, commercial redlining is the denial of credit or insurance or the offer of credit or insurance on terms that are more stringent than those that are generally prevailing. And so the, what that means in addition to um, limiting uh, financing for housing, looking today at practices of providing credit and um, funding and insurance to small business development and what that might look like. So, the goal of this project is to sort of think about how can we pivot to a new place in time that recognizes historically where we are and where the cultural awareness is of the costs and consequences of historic discrimination and how we can build on wins that are looking at um, not only health disparities and housing disparities and criminal justice disparities, but what is our legacy for who we wanna support with respect to business development and small business development in this country moving forward. Um, so commercial gentrification uh, is occurring. It's similar to housing gentrification in the context of um, changing property taxes um, in residential neighborhoods that are forcing people who've been in those neighborhoods to move out um, because they can no longer afford to stay there. But I'm going to provide a definition for um, oh, I did. Sorry, commercial gentrification that comes out of a study uh, provided by the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders that came out in May 1999. And it defines gentrification as real estate price appreciation that leads to involuntary displacement and significant cultural change. And so what's happening in many of our communities, in addition to residential gentrification is business gentrification where um, the businesses that developed to serve those particular communities are now encountering different types of residents and needing to find ways to maintain um, their business success. And many of them are unable to be able to thrive um, given the considerations and the challenges of the gentrification happening in those neighborhoods. So the idea that I want to think about in terms of what impact transaction might be able to do to resolve some of those problems is think about, so not only are African Americans and other people of color losing wealth as a result of um, not having housing equity to pass down, but when businesses and small businesses are forced to close because the residents that they serve are moving, then business equity is also not being able to be passed down in generation from generation. And that's also contributing to the wealth gap. Um, so what can we do in this time, this post pandemic, now that the post pandemic shock is sort of wearing off, not that um, COVID challenges are going anywhere to sort of realize that in addition to mass incarceration, in addition to health inequities, how can we also start to work on systemic reform that will protect our entrepreneurs of color in this country? Um, we know from COVID um, and sort of the social justice, distancing um, requirements and all of the federal responses to providing, prov uh, providing support to bring the economy back, that the economy um, and the nature of business is changing fundamentally in this country. Brick and mortar stores are not going to operate the same as they did before COVID occurred. And so a lot of minority business owners um, and entrepreneurs have brick and mortar stores and the sort of retail spaces or, or provide retail services. So how can we start to think systemically about protecting this understand, sorry, I'm reading a comment, which I shouldn't be. Um, yeah, okay. So how can we continue to, how can we provide mechanisms that are going to shore up and ensure that when the world gets to pivot and enters into this new um, realm that we don't lose more minority business owners or more entrepreneurs of color. And an idea that I am looking at is uh, inclusionary zoning, I'm gonna say in air quotes, um, for small business development. And what that looks like is 
uh, those of you who might be familiar with inclusionary zoning in the housing context might understand it to be um, local or state legislative um, programs and legislation that require developers to set aside certain units of affordable housing um, in new developments so that whatever the, the total number of market rate housing might be, there's a certain percentage of it set aside to allow for affordable housing so that people can also, of different income levels, can um, also benefit from that development. So this idea of inclusionary zoning looks at that model to see what kind of inclusionary zoning can we also have for business development. There are two ways to approach this. The first is a mandatory set aside, which is um, something that probably just caused a lot of people to clench up. But hear me out. I'm not, um, I, I, I am wanting to avoid the constitutional issues that are inherent in that process, but we have to recognize that there have been successful inclusionary zoning programs for housing in the country, and it's possible to track those programs in a business context. But going back to my earlier comments about my overall research agenda and looking at voluntary opportunities for people to agree, I think that there are opportunities, particularly now for cities who are really interested and invested in equity to consider what sorts of ways to, they can incentivize um, uh, folks who are doing redevelopment are looking at different ways to use um, what is uh, going to be a historic amount of sort of vacant and unused real estate to um, advance the um, needs of small business owners and business owners of color and take this opportunity to consider ways to differently uh, incentivize. So I'm not talking about tax credits or typical ways that we've incentivized development in cities in the past, but how can we actually build on the momentum of where this country could be going in terms of advancing racial equity, not in the, just in the criminal justice system or the housing system or the healthcare system, but also looking at these other areas because all of the historic wrongs sort of um, uh, have seethed into all these other areas and business development is one of those that also needs to be shored up. So can we get to a place where um, cities are able to negotiate with different incentives to um, ensure at the point of negotiation, particularly in real estate, but also just looking at not necessarily new real estate, but sort of the revamping of vacant real estate what we can do with those spaces to support our brick and mortar and retail small business owners. Um, I think I'm out of time, but I'm happy to talk about any of this in the Q&A and thank you. Thank you, Professor Crowder for all of your work. Our final speaker is Mr. Barrett Holmes Pittner. He is the founder and philosopher in chief of the Sustainable Culture Lab. And his work focuses on combating ethnocide and creating utopian practices. He is a philosopher, writer, and journalist focusing on race, culture, and politics. He is an advisory board member of the ABA's Center for Human Rights, Dignity Rights Initiative, and he has been a contributing columnist for The Daily Beast, The BBC, the Guardian, The Daily Dot, The Huffington Post, and other publications. Thank you, Mr. Pittner, for being here today. Yeah, th thanks for having me. Um, so I'd just like to say um, I, I really enjoyed everyone's talk thus far, and, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about will continue uh, the discussion that's already happened. Um, but to give a bit of background on, on me and my work, uh, for years I was a, an opinion columnist. I still write opinion pieces. And one thing I noticed is that as a race and culture writer, I just didn't feel that the language and the discourse that we were using to articulate the complex issues regarding race and culture in our society were actually adequate for the complexity and the, and the scope of the problem. And when you reach, um, when you don't have the words to articulate what you see and what you feel, um, there is the desire to start finding new words or creating new philosophies to articulate what you see. And that's, that's where my work started focusing more on. Instead of focusing on, let's use the existing language and try to you know, articulate everything through a, a paragraph or, or an essay, what's one word that I could find that can articulate a really complex idea and make it digestible? And so the word that I focused on is ethnocide. This word was created in 1944 by Raphael Lemkin, 
Uh, Lemkin was a Polish Jew who immigrated to the US uh, as he fled the Nazis uh, during World War II. And while he was in America, he was trying to raise awareness of what was happening to the Jewish people uh, in Europe. And a lot of Americans didn't believe that that type of atrocity could be happening in a civilized European society. And so what he did is he said, I have to create a word to articulate what's happening. And that word he created was genocide. And so once people were able to get this complex idea and attach it to one word, that atrocity became more real and international law and human rights law has changed radically because of the, the, the creation of this word. Well, when F. Lemkin created genocide, he also created the word ethnocide because Jewish people are a genos, which is a people, but they're also an ethnos, which is a culture and they are being targeted because of their culture. And so in his mind, ethnocide and genocide were gonna be interwoven terms that you could use interchangeably. But those words diverged over time and genocide became the all encompassing content, all encompassing language, because if you kill the people, the culture dies with them. And so ethnocide kind of got subsumed into genocide is what people thought. But what ended up really happening is that ethnocide created a new definition, which is you kill the culture, but you keep the people. And recent years, that language has been used to describe like colonization and things that have happened to indigenous people. But what I do to talk about my community and the impact on the African-American community and America at large is I apply that construct to the transatlantic slave trade because the goal of the transatlantic slave trade was for Europeans, this was their agenda, was to get African bodies, extract all of the African culture out of those people so that they could create a, a chattel slavery system in the Americas. That was just a foundational civilization concept that Europeans decided to forge when they just wanted to relocate to two other continents. And so with this language of ethnocide, you can see how the racial and economic and class divisions that shape America to this day derive from ethnocide from the very beginning. And so what, at, at the at beginning, uh, uh, Monique, she was talking about how, how redlining is a continuation of, of slavery. It's a continuation of Jim Crow. It's a continuation of the prison industrial complex. All these iterations from the very beginning, we, we always, America will always create new terms to, to describe a new iteration of the same cultural problem. And as, a, um, as, uh, as an American who's trying to combat this, if you're always creating like a plain linguistic catch up where five years ago, you're calling it one thing. And then this year you're calling it another thing or, or, or 20 years, you know, it was called slavery, but now it's called Jim Crow. What are we talking about? We're actually talking about the same thing and it's all ethnocide. And if you don't have that language to describe the same thing, you're always gonna be behind the eight ball because they'll just change the term for the same thing or they'll create like a new manifestation of the same systemic problem and pretend as though it's something completely different. Um, and so my work at, um, at the Sustainable Culture Lab, we talk about ethnocide and articulating how systematic it is in our society. And so, for example, if we're looking at COVID, COVID clearly is impacting communities of color more harshly than a white, and the, you know, um, Sheila Foster's map that showed Manhattan where like the, the white areas, it's almost like COVID didn't happen. And, and in the, the communities of color, it's just consumed with COVID. And this is, we like to describe this in many ways as like economic disparities and this and that, but it's a racial disparity because I'll say personally, my partner, her sister and, and nephew live in, live in Queens. And when COVID happened, we said, you gotta get out of there. Like, you gotta, you gotta get out of there. And now they live with us in DC. They've been in our house for months. And it's not because we don't have education or jobs or, or, or the opportunity to pursue the American dream or whatever. It's just there's a systemic structure in our society that determines that people of color live in different parts of town. Their salary is a little bit lower. And, 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 and also, not everyone in a community is going to be uh, an affluent individual. So if you live in a, a community where you want to be around your friends and your families and stuff, you know, you're going to have family members who are mechanics, who are plumbers, who have, who are cooks, 
and you can't just isolate and ensure that everyone's rich. If you are trying to be in a community that represents your people, you're gonna have all types of jobs and that is how communities of color function and that makes us more susceptible to these types of problems. Another thing you really need to think about with regard ethnocide is the goal of extracting culture from African people in creating the systemic division in our society was so that you could create perpetual exploitation of people of color. That was the goal. It wasn't to eradicate people of color. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't to forcefully remove them, or, or which is, you know, what colonizers did to indigenous people. It was to have communities of color be adjacent to white communities so that they could be exploited forever. And so if you look at the infrastructure of the South, you know, plantation owners, they kept their slaves on their own property adjacent to the to the to the map to the mansion because they have to have the people they're going to exploit right next to them. And America systemically is structured in this capacity. And so what we're talking about when we talk about COVID, but we're also at the same time talking about gentrification. Because with gentrification, it's not a coincidence that the community of color is adjacent to the white community, where that community of color gets less governmental resources. It gets the, the, the school system there is not as good because it's being based around, you know, the income of the residents determines the funding that they get. It's adjacent to the white area so that when those communities of color, those people of color have to get work, they can go to the white area to work. But the white area is not gonna divert tax dollars or resources to the black area because that black area, that city planning has been based around ensuring that those people get exploited forever. And when pandemics and systemic problems happen, the people who are exploited are going to get hit the worst. That's just always what's going to happen. And if we're talking about gentrification, this is where it gets, gets kind of, this is, it's not funny, but it's, it's, it's tragicomic, I guess, is that capitalism is going to price white people out of their own territory. They're going to create a system that's going to make it unaffordable for them to live in their own area because property values are going to increase as people make more and more money. And so the children of like an affluent person who can't afford to have a house in their parents' neighborhood is gonna to have to look for someplace affordable to live. And that place is gonna be the black community that's adjacent to the white community. They're gonna to go to that, they're gonna go there and they're gonna say, we're coming here and we're gonna be beneficial because we're just really great people and we believe in some benevolence of, of white ideas and concepts. And then they're gonna push out the black people. And then some people might be malicious in that engagement, some people might not be, but that's the process. And the black people in that community can't move too far away because they still have to go to the white economic sectors to find employment and to find opportunity. And the cycle just continues and continues and continues. And it's just a, a constant iteration of displacement that's displacing black people. And it's also displacing white people. White people just don't feel as problem, don't feel the brunt of it because they get to exploit people while they displace them. Uh, they, that's their like their safety net. And so one thing that I focus on about how do we come up with solutions to these systemic problems, because one thing that happens is when you start using the language of ethnocide, you realize that it's everywhere. It makes you feel quite sad um, and down about the structure of our society. So you then you have to start coining new philosophy, new language to give people a template for what something counter to what we know is. Because what we do right now is we get stuck in these linguistic games of trying to define the, the next iteration of ethnocide. You know, uh, we, we, we spent the time we define slavery, we know that's bad. And then ethnocide says, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna modify it and we're gonna make it Jim Crow. And now we're gonna spend a bunch of time defining Jim Crow and say that's bad. You're always playing catch up and you're not playing the game of articulating language and concepts that allow us to transcend these systemic divisions that we've never spent any time naming. And so what I did is the word utopia is a farce. We don't really talk about it, but it means good place that doesn't exist. That's just what, that's literally what the word means. And so the idea that Europeans got on boats and went places to literally, literally try to make good places that don't exist is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. And I think in many ways they may have succeeded. Um, so I just got the word good, which is EU in Greek, and topia, which is place, and made evtopia. So it's not utopia, it's, it's ev because EU in Greek, 
is pronounced ev, not u. Uh, so it's evtopia, it means good place. We work to create those types of structures and give people this type of language. So at least you can start imagining what good looks like instead of imagining how to counter bad. And I guess one of the key things that to create something good is you have to start changing the framework of the conversation we're having. Where well, right now we like to look at everything via race. And race is a very real concept in the US, but race is a notion that was fabricated by colonizers. And race is also static. You know, while you're alive, you can't change your race. If you have an interracial marriage, your kid's race will be something different than, than yours, but you as an individual, your race is static. And so if our narrative is blaming people about these problems in our society because of race, you're gonna handicap people. You're gonna make people feel like they're trapped within their own skin and unable to like create or even imagine adequate solutions. And so when we talk about ethnocide, we're talking about a cultural problem. We're talking about European people who decide to make a culture of destroying the culture of other people and living via that destruction. Like when, when Lemkin came up with genocide, there was a culture of Nazi people who created a culture of destroying the culture of other people and the language of calling that an atrocity was a thing that existed that empowered people to combat that. What we're talking about is there's literally a culture of people that came up with a culture of extracting culture from non-white people to create systemic oppression in perpetuity. Like the language for that is an atrocity. Like, and we shouldn't be, uh, we, we should be really clear about that. It's, and what the issue right ha that's happening right now is without the word, you don't have the power to call something an atrocity. People are then get empowered to do atrocious things and believe that they're good or believe that they're banal because we don't have the language. And if we talk about it via race, they're gonna believe that they can't do anything to fix it because they're trapped within their own skin. But if it's a cultural action, if it's something that you can change based on your actions, based on your philosophy, based on your words, based on the laws you try to, try to craft, that empowers everyone to make something better. And like, that's what we're trying to do. Like we're really right now just talking about how do we make it so that people can live in houses and not be exploited in their own house as they live forever. Like that's a crazy concept that we are still trying to figure out how a house is, can become a place for someone to live and not a place where you'd be exploited forever while you sleep, while you eat, while you hang out with your kids. Like that's an atrocity that we still haven't figured that out in this society for years, for centuries. That's what we're talking about right now. And until we have the language to be strong enough to call that what it is, we can't come up with the ideas to come up with the, and articulate the solutions or articulate the scope of the problem. These aren't tangential problems. These aren't derivations of a society that's been idyllic for a long time and it went astray. No, we're talking about something that was built upon an atrocious concept of how you interact with human beings. And then we've just normalized it and created language to make it seem that it's just casual and simple. And it's just that this is just how the world works. This isn't really how the world works. There's plenty of places throughout the world that haven't worked like this. America is just a gigantic place of 300 million people. And a lot of places throughout the world as they're countering and recognizing how, how problematic our language is and how much we condone atrocities and how we make it hard for people to live dignified lives. They are talking about the importance of ensuring that you create structures for people to live with dignity and being in your house and getting exploited all the time because someone views where you live as an opportunity for them to extract money off of you because you're just alive. That takes the dignity from the exploited and it takes dignity from the exploiters. And that's a very profound and troubling problem. And this conversation and what's happening in the US right now is all about how do we confront this? How do we create structures to counter this Black Lives Matter movement? Everything we're talking about right now is African-Americans saying our lives are not here to be exploited and taken advantage of. We have a basic human right to live dignified lives. Dignity incorporates just being able to drive down the street, not getting like pulled over, 
it's being able to go inside your house and feel safe and not that someone's taking advantage of you. And we as a society are now realizing that that's something that we should consider. And that is indicative of the amount of work that we need to do um, and the language we have to cultivate and um, the progress that must occur. And so I really appreciate the time that you guys have uh, afforded me today. I really think it's great that uh, the American Bar Association is holding these, this space because once we, so for Raphael Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin was a philosopher. He also spoke good six to seven languages and he was a lawyer. And so to make this systemic change that he did with genocide, you have to have the philosophy, you have to have the language, and then you also have to have like the legal know-how to create laws so that you can articulate the problems and then make laws so that this is illegal. And so I really appreciate that the American Bar Association has held this space so that these, uh, my philosophical concepts, the language that I'm, I'm cultivating um, can hopefully be applied and incorporated into legal structures that can make it easy for people to have dignified lives and not uh, feel like their existence in a society is one of constant exploitation, even while they sleep in their house and have fun with their kids. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Pittner. I would like to now open up and begin the Q&A portion of our conversation. So the, four, the first question is by Mr. Ron Hans. Um, he stated that I don't think much dialogue is being discussed today on strengthening black community development ecosystems locally and nationally. My question is more of a challenge of how do we strengthen the capacity of building those black nonprofits and for profits? Who is that directed towards? He posed it to the entire panel. Yes. Could you repeat the question? He stated, um, his question is, how do we strengthen the capacity um, of building those black nonprofits and for profits? So how do we strengthen the black community development ecosystems locally and nationally? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll chime in. I'll say I'm not an expert on economic development and like the, the legal structures to create nonprofits, but the, I guess that the, the key thing for strength in any kind of community is to cultivate, for anything to be strong, you have to be able to do consistent actions over an extended period of time. There's no, you know, like Americans use the notion of like a silver bullet where you just do something once and everything gets fixed or whatever. No, no, like you have to, it has to be consistent action within the black community, but also the communities that we interact with. Like black people, even though America likes to pro like project that we live in isolation, that we don't interact with all sorts of people all the time, that we do. Like we, we're at the American Bar Association right now. Like, so the question isn't really how do black communities do things to strengthen black nonprofits? Like we have historically put in a lot of work to strengthen our communities. Um, and, and uplift other communities. And if you talk to uh, any other community of color and you ask about their, their movements, there's a very good likelihood that they're gonna be inspired by some African-American uh, figure throughout the past that helped them create their entity. The question really isn't how do we as black people improve, it's how do we create structures that don't undermine the diligent work that we've been doing for centuries. Um, can I also just add to that uh, briefly? I think two things to sort of consider and what the panelists have been laying out is sort of the historical context in which all of our businesses and nonprofits are operating. And I add to that to locality. What's the, what's the history of the locality in which a nonprofit or business in San Francisco is operating versus one in DC? Um, but barriers of entry are important and they're historical. And even though I think we all probably have a good sense of how to articulate those things. We haven't quite gotten to the point of how to um, not only name them, but actually create systemic efforts at reforming them. And so it's, it's, it's a mix of, you know, is it, it's not just injection of capital, it's just not um, providing access to 
um, certain types of experiences or certain types of technical assistance. It's a broad, um, there are broad challenges that are being um, impacted by our businesses and our, our nonprofits that I think require more of a systemic holistic approach, but it definitely stems from having more engaged and thoughtful responses to combating barriers of entry and you know the historic I live in Denver which doesn't have the the same history of race relations for example that um, folks on the coast have experienced so every place is unique and different and needs um, like a, a localized thoughtful approach to examining the particular barriers of entry in that area okay thank you so much for your responses our next question comes from Shashi Hanuman. She stated, um, hi, I'm very interested in further exploring this idea about inclusionary strategies for small business owners of color. We are seeing massive levels of commercial small businesses, small business evictions in LA. So I guess just strategies on um, how to have more inclusion for small business owners of color, whoever feels um, compelled to answer the question. I um, certainly hope others can contribute. I might, I'll start just, um, I think there are different ideas about sort of coalition building that might be helpful um, because even though, um, you know, sort of this idea of a student who's actually doing a research paper on sort of this idea of commercial tenants associations, for example, in organizing, um, the importance of organizing can't be understated. And I think there are lessons about organizing in the securing of personal rights that can transcend to some of the victimization that small business owners might be feeling. Um, so I think organizing is an important thing. Tenants associations, one of the national examples that have come out of the COVID epidemic, for example, are the restaurant industry associations, sort of realizing um, their power in, in, in different trade associations for trying to advance the rights of restaurant workers, for example. And so I, I definitely think organizing is a, an important component to um, this particular challenge. So, <clears throat> so the one thing I'll say is that if we look to inclusionary uh, zoning for housing, there are some, I think, reasons to be optimistic and also uh, lessons um, uh, and even some, uh, uh, or reasons to be skeptical, I guess, uh, because, and I know that, you know, patience isn't uh, suggesting this as a, um, as a panacea, right? It's just one um, tool in the toolbox. Uh, but, you know, one of the things about inclusionary zoning for housing in uh, cities where uh, land values have skyrocketed is that developers build these new developments with a promise of setting aside a certain amount of units for affordable or, or, or uh, for households that fall below a particular percentage of the area median income. And what we know is that that percentage um, and the area media income of the area media income is not sufficient to really reach the most at need. Um, so even affordable housing isn't really truly affordable uh, for many families. And I don't know if that translates to the commercial sector, but I will say that, you know, there are limits to this kind of this, um, some would call it neoliberal, but an over-reliance on market actors to produce like opportunisms, for instance, you know, an over-reliance on market actors to produce what um, we should view as public goods, right? Housing as a good that everyone gets to have, affordable housing. And I think that there are um, alternative structures like community land trusts and other structures that put wealth in communities, allow communities to control land, to have access to land, and some of these vacant structures that a patient uh, talks about, there are other approaches, right, to distributing those resources, uh, those available public resources to communities and allowing them to empower themselves uh, by giving them access to that to build uh, collective wealth. And so I'll just say that I think there's a range of possibilities, um, and the inclusionary zoning is only one of them. And I think that there are lessons from the housing arena for that. I'll just say I completely agree with Sheila on those points. I think the uh, a different dimension about 
this particular idea is sort of um, what are what are ways to incentivize developers and other private actors to voluntarily participate in these activities? And so the exploration of this idea is um, sort of focused on that particular area. I wholeheartedly, um, you know, agree with the idea of land trust and other things, and what the the idea that these are certain public goods, um, but recognizing that we might not be at the point where we can get wins in those particular areas. What are the other ways that we can incentivize again in a non-tax based incentive way people to you know otherwise do what I think are also just the right thing. Yeah I'll I'll chime in. I'd say like just kind of to continue what Sheila and Patience have, have alluded to, but I think regarding to business and kind of any sort of organizing in society, we have a narrative of the market driven forces as like the regulator, but like the market in the US has always been something that's been manipulated to favor white Americans ahead of non white Americans. So it's already like the this notion of like a neutral market. It's already been, uh, you know, uh, corrupted or, or, or unbalanced. And so as we're talking about like in inclusionary strategies, the, the key thing is to envision possibilities outside of like a market perspective where you and, and these ideas in many ways have like a very large stigma attached to them in the US. If you start thinking of anything that's related to socialism or communism, you are just now perceived to be a crazy person. But like Europe made those institutions after their own industrialization and reliance on capitalism started destabilizing uh, communities of disadvantaged people. And so like these ideas popped into their heads when what's happening to communities of color now were happening to various groups of white people in Europe. And so it's, it's against our own best interest to not look at European solutions to European problems as they manifest and impact Americans over here. And so, you know, liberating yourself from an over-reliance on free markets uh, to solve problems and tragically, due to like the, our neoliberal perspective, we view that we have the government as a role, as its job is to just let the free market exist. And so in many places, the government and these institutions that encourage people to come together communally has been the regulation on capitalism. But America is kind of just very much like a wild, wild west scenario where there is a narrative of no regulation from the government or from the industry itself and that communities of color are just hoping that a structure that is built to not benefit them, that has been problematic in the past, will some way just rectify itself in a way that it's never done to benefit people that it just doesn't benefit. And so uh, to be more inclusionary, definitely think about how to create your own communal structures that support each other um, to counter these uh, market capitalistic pressures that disproportionately harm communities of color in the U.S. Right here, here, <laughs> I would say definitely. Thank you so much for your responses. The next question comes from Scott Bernstein. His question is, what would be a just response to redlining? What would those goals look like for beyond redlining? And it's for any member of the panel. Yeah, I'll I mean, chime in. Um, so so I, I will chime in, but I'm also going to reference, um, and, and Sheila Foster's uh, intro, they reference the, the city as a commons. And I, I will say, I haven't read that article, but I do think that a lot of places in Europe and throughout other parts of the world their cities are structured around valuing common space and not private space, not property. The US has an inverse perspective where people feel that they have freedom within the privacy of their own home where private space trumps human space, trumps like pri property rights, trump human rights. And that narrative makes people perceive the other as a constant competition, that they're only safe when they're in their own home. And so if you have an, a cultural narrative 
that, that articulates that black people are inherently problematic in some capacity and also a narrative that you only have safety with inside your house, people are gonna think that division is the way for a solution. But most places throughout the world, the solutions to division has been articulating the importance of common space. Like if you, like any European city you go to that you think is attractive and you wanna visit has a town square that no one's gonna think about putting condos on. Like it would be the most undignified, abhorrent thing to put a condo in the middle of these like beautiful town squares. You can go throughout the, you know, you can go to the Middle East and they'll have bazaars and trading places where people gather communally and interact in an equitable way. And that's the social fabric of their society. Like America doesn't understand that that's how societies have lived. And so we try to create almost the inversion of like the inverse of civilized life by dividing people in perpetuity, trapping ourselves in our own houses and thinking that's what freedom looks like. And it's just absolutely absurd. Right. And so the, you know, the way that you have to counter redlining is for people to counter the idea that they're safer when they aren't around the people in their community. Because, and that, that's just foundational to the US and it's really tragic. Like I'll, I'll say, like the neighborhood, neighborhood that I live in, it has become increasingly gentrified. And the thing that is problematic, it's not that like the new white people that moved in are rude or anything like that. It's just that I don't know them. They don't say hi. There's not an incentive to like become my neighbor and talk to me and create those relationships that have been the social fabric of like so many communities and so many places around the world where you can, you know, have people collectively assist with raising your kids or help you out if you need trouble. Like that's how people have lived forever. And, you know, now we live around strangers all the time and think that's a solution. And I think that's quite problematic. And so the way that you start fixing the problem is not necessarily making like a legal change here or there. Like you definitely have to make those and make regulations, but you have to like change your perspective about what you consider to be like a free, comfortable way of living and being isolated in your house. I don't know why anybody would think that would be a free way to live. Let me just say a couple of things and I wanna bundle some other questions because I know we're running out of time uh, with this um, question and a couple of other questions asked about legislation calling for the return of property from blacks through inequitable use of eminent domain uh, connected to reparations and then uh, someone asked me a question about uh, should lawyers be working on issues pertaining to zoning. And what Barrett said, in the reference to my work, I say, wait for the book, don't read that article. <laughs> but the reference is really just to piggyback on, we need to think anew about our system that hasn't worked for Black folks, right? Um, and it's two systems. One is the economic system. So I referenced before the uh, relying on the market to provide goods such as uh, housing through these incentive-based programs, which I think work sometimes, but a lot of times fall short. Um, and then having the government, as Barrett said, kind of try to regulate that market, right? Um, and the other system that doesn't work, I think, is our system of property, right? Um, notwithstanding the fact that Blacks were property, um, we also know that much of the land held historically by Blacks um, has over time been stolen or lost or we've been uh, dispossessed. And that includes rural black lands, uh, but it also includes today um, houses, not just the foreclosure crisis, but, uh, um, uh, but um, high um, foreclosure, uh, tax foreclosures today, where black folks who own property are being overtaxed and their houses are being taken from them in places like Detroit and other cities. There's a wonderful article out by a colleague of ours Hours Bernadette Atwanhe uh, called Predatory Cities in California Law Review, which is worth looking at for this. So I think, so when I talk about the commons and Barrett's right that the Europeans are ahead of us in terms of this, but the idea is that we need to think beyond public and private to think about ways to get folks resources that are in the public domain, land being one of them, st structures being another, uh, 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 financing, being another to allow our communities to build in place, to stay in place and to build wealth collectively. But we also need to be working on the tools that we have. And that's why I mentioned current laws. We can't just say, don't you know, use current laws because people need help today. People who are being evicted need help today. People who are living in substandard 
housing need help enforcing the right to to uh, to adequate housing, right? People need help today. People need food today, right? So we need to do to be doing both, both rethinking the larger system, but also thinking anew about legal changes, like doing away with certain types of zoning or banning certain types of harmful uh, land uses that will help people today. So I think we need to be doing both, but we do need to think about new frameworks. I really appreciate uh, Barrett's response. Thank you for your response. The next question comes from Juran Hendricks. Uh, one of the issues discussed has been how public schools and access to good schools have been limiting, has been limited by redlining and refunding structures. Are charter schools the answer to improve these conditions? No. Uh, no. <laughs> I'll, uh, no. I'll keep on talking. I'm not an education expert, but like we're literally talking about a structure that we acknowledge doesn't like intentionally underserves communities and and private education in the US in many ways, especially in the context of the South, was created so that white children didn't have to go to school alongside black children. Like that's why that's what pri these private schools throughout the South were created. And so the notion that this pro this concept of private education that is detached from the government but then gets government funding was created to segregate people and you know distance you know communities of color from white people. And then we say we're going to fix communities of color by essentially trying to give them their own privatized schools and defund the public schools and these pri you know these these private schools that get funding from the government it's like we're not asking for solutions to be that we get like the derivatives of what white people created to segregate themselves from us the solutions are let's create structures that give people like equal opportunities to get like a fair education and not structures based around funding schools on how much money someone's parents make like it's just it's, a, it's, it's just tragic that the education a child's gonna get is based on the income that their parents earn. That does, that's setting people up to fail and it's setting other people to get an education that they just won't actually need to even um, <laughs> to use because if the system's already rigged where you get the, the best education, the best jobs, just because of where you live, you don't actually need to be good at things to get good things sent your way. And so, so no, like giving black people uh, a, like a derivation of what white people created to segregate themselves is not gonna be the solution to educational problems. I agree, I'll just chime in and say that I think um, the funding of public education is definitely one of the um, sort of the, the right to a public education is a, an example of one of the sort of public good concepts, right? Charter schools exist as a failure to properly fund um, public education in this country and people sort of pulling their, their kids out to um, segregate as, as Barrett was talking about. But also I wanna recognize and acknowledge that there are certainly some African-American communities and other communities of color who felt they had no other choice um, but to form charter schools as a way of educating their children. So it's a little complex, but there's a um, professor at the University of North Carolina, Erica Wilson, who's done some fabulous, 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 outstanding work on um, equity in public education and financing. And I would say if that's a particular concern of yours, I would look her up and her bio because um, the, the, the right outcome there would be to properly fund all public schools so that people don't feel one, the need to have a charter school to better educate their children and two, people can't get around um, and try and isolate and, and protect their children from you know, sort of improper perceived evils. Yeah, and I'll just add very quickly that Patience is absolutely right. I mean, charter schools are an end run around um, the issue of how we fund um, public schools, which is through property taxes, right? So Barrett has mentioned a couple of times 
the income of parents, your income determines how much of a house you can afford. And schools are funded by property taxes, which is why the neighborhoods with the biggest and most expensive houses, they pay the highest property taxes and they get the best schools, right? And so there have been numerous lawsuits brought to try to, um, to, try to change that funding formula. So the rise of charter schools and the reason why African Americans take advantage of them, it's, you know, to my point earlier, you have to, people need stuff today. Right, so it's not irrational for them to uh, form charters because that's the best tool they have right now. But the root of the problem is the funding mechanisms for public schools, and until we change that, then we're going to continue to have these second best solutions. And I just and wanted to go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to add to that that one of the ways that they determine how many prisons they'll need in the future is by the education uh, of the third at the third grade level. So when you look at it, it comes back to full circle because as Sheila said, that uh, the better neighborhoods with the bigger houses pay the higher property taxes and have the better schools, the neighborhoods that are obviously resource starved uh, don't have the better schools and the third grade education level is where they determine what prisons they're going to build uh, for those for going forward. Um, so again, it does all, you know, come back to the circle uh, that I think everyone has talked about. And also just to add one thing to that kind of piggybacks off of what everyone said, but I think patients started this, this line of talking uh, is a lot of African American charter schools are really beneficial to the communities. But the example of African Americans doing a lot with a little is not indicative of us getting enough to make sustained equitable change. And I think the US far too often gives black people far too little. Cherry picks an example of us being exceptional off of getting nothing and saying, look, the system works. No, the system is, is, is problematic at its core and the success that African-Americans have from that system is more indicative of the structures that we create, our communal structures, and not indicative of the benefit of these exploitative structures that are constantly thrust upon us. Thank you so much. That is our final question of the day. Thank you to everyone for joining us for this free webinar. We'd also like to express our gratitude to the system esteemed group of panelists. You all are doing such critical work and we thank you for taking time out of your schedule to share your knowledge, research and experiences. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you in your work. And again, you, if you can, please consider joining and becoming an active member in the ABA. You may do so at ambar.org forward slash CRSJ. You can find information on other fee programs on the CRSJ webpage. Best of luck in all of your work and stay safe, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having me.